Next lesson, did Jesus die spiritually? And this I put together after viewing the faith teachers, all of them teaching that Jesus died spiritually, that Jesus went into hell, had to be battled there by Satan three days and three nights. Finally, Jesus takes the keys of death and hell away from Satan and comes out of the grave. That's all a fable. A story that doesn't match the word at all. It's impossible that Jesus should die spiritually. If he didn't die spiritually, there's no way he could go to the place of torment or judgment. That was reserved only for the ungodly. And he tells that story in Luke 16. So this has been written to refute the great lie that's still out there today, still being circulated all over the world by the faith teachers. There are many today, and I wrote this so I could mail it out in the mail, but it's, it's good to have it in this form. There are many today within the ranks of the Church of Jesus Christ that are making dozens of statements regarding the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and what actually took place in this once and for all atonement. The statements by these men on TV, radio, and cassette tapes and books have created much confusion among the body of Christ. This teaching that you're going to read has been put together for the purpose of stating the true position of the Word of God and to assist in putting away those things that destroy the faith of the saints. Here is a composite statement including all the thoughts that are being put forth by these men today regarding the atoning work of Christ. Please remember that we do not and are not judging the hearts or motivation of these men, but rather the words that they speak in public meetings or they write in a book. They say that Jesus Christ died spiritually, that he took the thief on the cross with him to Abraham's bosom, left him there, and then Jesus went on into the lower region of the damned of hell. Kenneth Copeland said it was an elevator. He took the elevator down, dropped him off in paradise, stayed in the elevator, and went down to hell. Oh, boy. There Jesus suffered at the hands of Satan for three days and three nights, suffered all that hell had to offer. They, they think he had to suffer that way. But you see, we're going to find out that the suffering was done on the cross in full view. That Christ had to find, fight Satan in hell and then strip him, Satan, of all of his authority. That Christ was tormented by Satan and his angels and finally God said that was enough. Christ was then born again. You realize if he dies spiritually, he has to be born again. Who is his Savior? Who died for him? If he could be born again without a Savior, then Jesus didn't have to die. God could have done it without Christ. That Christ was born again, took the keys of death and hell, and came out of the grave. They further say that when Jesus said it is finished, that it was not. That he still had to go to hell and fight Satan and his demons that even the Old Testament type of the brazen serpent on the pole is a symbol of Christ becoming a sinner on the cross. Dear friends, that's blasphemy. So I go through these notch by notch. Number one, there are at least 30 scriptures in the Bible that teach us that Jesus died for us. That is directly referring to the cross. The word for is the Greek, and the Greek is hooper, which means in the behalf of, instead of, showing that Christ's work was a substitution in place of the sin penalty that we would have to pay. Substitution, which is not a Bible word, simply means exactly what the Greek shows Christ's work to be. But substitution could not and does not mean identical with the one for whom you are substituting for. For example, if a man was guilty of back taxes and another came and paid those taxes, would he merely be a substitute for the guilty man? Or he would be a, merely a substitute for the guilty man, but the one pain would never be charged with or assume a position of guilt. You see, he just merely went and paid the man's debt for him. You never was guilty. You didn't have to be guilty. You did it for the other person, see. Christ died on our behalf, but was not personally charged a sinner or guilty of any personal sin. He was dying for a world who were being charged by God as being personal sinners, and thus the sin penalty of death was assigned to them. Point number two. Second Corinthians, oh, they love this one, 521 says that God made Christ to be sin for us, in place, instead of, on the behalf of. <coughs> but since sin, uh, Christ never sinned personally, 
he, Christ, was made a sin offering on our behalf or a sin offering in the place of or instead of us. A sin offering for does not make the one offering a sinner. James 4.17 clearly teaches that a person who knows to do good and then by choice does it not is a sinner. Christ went to the cross in obedience to the will of God and therefore did not become a sinner personally, but merely a sin offering for us. The verse goes on to clearly explain that Christ, who knew no sin, he personally experienced no sin, and the only way he could have died a sinner was to personally sin. 1 John 3, 4 also tells us that whosoever committed sin transgresses the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. Christ did neither. Isaiah 53, 9 tells us, that he, Christ, was buried with the wicked or made his grave physically with the same as all the wicked sinners that die. Further, it clearly states that he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now, if the first part of the verse states that he, number one, made his grave with the wicked, and number two, there was no violence or deceit in him, then Christ died as the God-man without personal sin. He died without anyone else's sins causing him to sin or be a sinner. You've heard me use the illustration, when he died, it didn't have sin stuck to him like gobs of peanut butter, everybody's sin in the world. He's a substitute. He has no sin. He's not taking anybody's sin in that sense. He's substituting for it, the righteous for the unrighteous. Ezekiel 18.20, point number four, clearly informs us that the soul or the person, the individual that sins, it shall die. Unless a soul or a person sins, he cannot die spiritually. Saints will all die. Saints will die without sin, but saints will not die spiritually. Christ died for the world, having taken on a physical body so he could die. If all Christ had to do was to die spiritually, he could have come down in a spiritual body and then taken the sins of the world and just died spiritually. Jesus could have never died spiritually unless he had personally sinned himself by his own choice. That's the whole definition of sin. Five. Another question to ponder is, if Christ died a sinner, who was his atonement? The Bible clearly teaches that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission or forgiveness of sins. Who was the atonement for Christ? If God could just speak out while Christ was in a hellish torment and say, that's enough, and then Christ was born again and released from hell, then God could have done the same thing for all of mankind, and Christ didn't need to go to the cross. God could have spoken to, Abraham, uh, to Adam and Eve, forgiven their sins, regenerated them, and they could have lived for eternity. Point number six, Colossians 2.15 tells us, And Jesus, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The it of this verse is the cross. It never could refer to hell or that Christ had to go to hell to triumph over Satan. The verse tells us that Christ did that openly. Spoil means to strip off or put off, and Christ did that at the cross, not in secret below the earth. The allusion here is to the custom of conquerors making a public demonstration of conquered enemies. Satan thought he was the conqueror when he died, but when Jesus died, but Christ was the conqueror instead. If all of this happened below the earth, then the scripture is in error. Point number seven, Luke 23, 39 through 43, shows the story between Christ and the repentant thief. Christ tells him that today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Christ didn't say he was going to leave the thief in paradise, but he would be with Christ in paradise. <coughs> when Christ ascended into heaven, paradise was moved from beneath the earth into heaven in the presence of God. And we give you two scriptures for that.
These are things that these men are teaching, and you've got to know the word to undo these lies. Number eight, the Old Testament, Job, shows the devil as appearing in heaven in the presence of God, while in the New Testament he's called the prince of the world of the earth. And in Matthew 8, 29, the demons ask Jesus if he's going to torment them before the time. No place in the New Testament did we find that either Satan or any angels are in hell, a place of torment. And yet most of Christianity believes they're down there today. The only view of hell, the place of torment, is shown to us in Luke 16. But in the whole story, not one time does it state that any of the torment is being caused by Satan or his angels. <coughs> We don't find Satan being put into such a place of torment until final judgment in Revelation 20, verse 10. Therefore, the story of Jesus going on to hell, being tormented, is scripturally incorrect. Satan isn't down there anyway. 9. Jesus did go into paradise with the thief, and there he preached to the Old Testament saints that were held captive in Abraham's bosom until such a time, number one, their sins could be removed from their conscience. <coughs> Number two, they could be reconciled or rejoined to God through Jesus Christ in a spirit life, none of which they experienced while alive on earth as Christ had not given his life as the once and for all atonement. See the order by reading these scriptures right here, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, Hebrews 4, 2, and 6, 1 Peter 4, 6. Proof that the Old Testament saints needed the cross before being allowed into heaven can be proven by reading the following scriptures. Hebrews 2, 15, Hebrews 7, 19, Hebrews 9, 9, and 15, Hebrews 10, 14, Hebrews 11, 13, 39, 40, and finally Hebrews 12, 22, and 23. 10. No place in the Bible does it teach that Christ got the keys of hell and death from Satan. Those keys of authority came after his resurrection from the grave. Multiple verses in the gospel shows that Christ had complete authority from his father prior to the cross. But it only took his resurrection from the grave to give him then, and the power and authority over death, hell and death. Jesus stated that he had the power to raise himself up, and therefore he didn't get any power by having to fight or beat up on Satan. After three days and nights, Christ arose from the grave based on his own statement that he would raise himself. See John 10, 18. But if Jesus had sinned or was made a real sinner, he would have lost his holy power to take up his life again. He would then have to have an atonement made for him. 11. Hebrews 2, 14, 15 shows that Jesus had to take on a flesh and blood body in order to die a physical death and thus complete the once and for all atonement. The flesh and blood form is directly connected to the word death to show what kind of death he should suffer for the world. Not spiritual, physical. Twelve. There are over 37 separate references in the Bible to show that it is the blood that God used to seal both covenants. It was the blood of Christ that was shed for sin and not his spiritual death. Blood is the type of the Old Testament, and thus Christ came to fulfill the Old Testament, and his blood was shed for the New Testament, or New Covenant. Thirteen, from the first Passover and Exodus, to the Lord's Supper of the Gospels, to the communion setting of 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 32, we have the two symbols of the bread and juice representing the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. If Christ died spiritually, and it was his spiritual death that made the atonement, then there is absolutely nothing given in the entire Bible to show symbolically in the Passover, Last Supper, or Communion that he died spiritually. Since the Spirit, or the Spirit of God, is symbolized by either water or oil, then our Communion service should have us eating the bread, drinking the juice, body and blood, and then doing one more thing with either water or oil to show something about the spirit died. Since there is no such symbol, then you can rest assured that Christ did not die spiritually. Fourteen, they also use first, or the, excuse me, Colossians 1.18 to claim that Christ was the first born again from the dead. My, how many times have I heard him say that? 
The Bible says firstborn, not born again. Firstborn simply means the first one to be born up from the dead in a resurrected body. Anyone that had died and was resurrected previous to the resurrection of Christ was not resurrected in a new spiritual or immortal or into immortality. Eternal life is what we receive when we accept Christ as our Savior. Immortality is what we receive in the body when we come out of the grave at the second resurrection. Christ was eternal life. He could never die. Because he took on a flesh body and then was killed, it was necessary that he be raised with immortality. 15, 1 Peter 3, 8 states that Christ died in the flesh. This would have to be an excellent place for the Holy Spirit to pen that he died in the spirit. However, there's no verse in the Bible that states he died in the spirit and none even to imply it. As a matter of fact, it's not even hinted at in the Bible. The second part of the verse says he was quickened by the Holy Spirit. But it was body, his body that was quickened or given life, not his spirit. Even the saints of God are not quickened in their spirit at resurrection. Our spirit is reborn upon coming to Christ. We are quickened and regenerated at that time. See Romans 8, 6 through 13. Number 16, 1 Peter 2, 24 tells us that Christ bare or bore our sins in his own body and not in his spirit. Jesus didn't need to go to hell or torment to take care of our sins as he bore them in his body at the cross, the symbolism being through that death. Not pasted on him like peanut butter, but in the death of the body he bore. 17, Acts 2.24, they say means spiritual death, but Christ only died physically as already proven. Beholden of it was physical death and remaining underground in Abraham's bosom. Physical death could not hold Christ simply because he was sinless and did not die spiritually. If he died spiritually, then the grave could not hold his body as it did all the saints and sinners that died under the Old Testament. But he never sinned, never died spiritually, therefore, and thus the grave could not hold him as he had not personally violated any of the laws of God it merely became a substitute for sinful man in taking man's sin in his body at the cross. 18, Acts 2.27 shows that his soul, the eternal part of one's personality and native constitution, was not to be left in Sheol or Hades, Abraham's bosom. Neither did his body see corruption or decay. Since Christ did not sin, then neither would his body decay in the grave. The human body can only see corruption after the spirit dies with sin. That is why we age and get older. Christ would have never aged if he was still alive today. Physical death only comes as a result of spiritual death. Therefore, his body did not see corruption. Ours do upon death. See all the rest of the New Testament readings of corruption. Number 19, Acts 2.24 tells us that death could not hold Christ as soon as he died, thus taking the penalty of man's sin, fulfilling the prophecy of three days and three nights. He, through his own choice and the co-work of God and the Holy Spirit, then was raised from the dead as death had no claims on Christ, he had never sinned, beyond the substitution for man's sin. Number 20, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. Notice that God the Father was in Christ during the whole work of the cross. Verse 21, again, he the Father hath made him Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin. To be sin for us is to be the same as the Old Testament types, a sin offering. Who knew no sin has never experienced sin personally. Number 21, John 1 Chapter 1, verse 110, 14, and 29 shows Jesus was God. If he is to take away the sins of the world, he cannot be a sinner or even die sinful or spiritually. If he was God and God cannot die spiritually. If one person of the Godhead died, they will all have died spiritually. They are one God, not three gods. 22, Hebrews 9, 13, and 14. Here Christ is said to have been without spot or sin. He could not die spotted or he would not have been a substitute. 23, Leviticus 6, 24 through 29. The offering was most holy in the Old Testament. Whatever touched it was holy. If the type, the body of the beast, was holy after death, then most certainly the fulfillment through Christ was holy. The moment he died, he was still holy. The type was, Christ must have been. 
24, John 19, 28, and 30. Here it clearly teaches us that Jesus knew all things that were they were now accomplished. In verse 30, Jesus said, It is finished. Neither of his statements could be true if he still had to go to the place of torment and battle Satan and his demons for three more days and three more nights. It was not finished yet. Page 11, point 25 at the top. These men say that Christ's death fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was an everlasting covenant. That's proven to you in Genesis 17, verse 7 and 13. Psalms 105, verses 8 through 10, and Galatians 3, the whole chapter. Abraham is your father if you are born again. He is the father of faith and of the faithful. When Christ died, it was the Mosaic covenant that was fulfilled. Proves that in Matthew 5, 17. The law was a part of the Mosaic covenant. That's out of Romans 8, 3 and 4. Point 26 out of Luke 23, 46. Here Jesus turns his spirit over to the Father, not Satan. Nothing was ever told to Jesus about his being in torment for three days and three nights, and never did Jesus tell anyone that story. 27 out of Matthew 27, 46 is sometimes used to show that Christ was separated from the Father by the sins of the world through substitution, and thus Christ died spiritually. In the Aramaic translation of the Peshitta, it reads, My God, my God, for this I was spared. And the footnote even reads, This was my destiny. This matches what Christ said in John 12, 27. For this hour I have come. This is the appointed hour. Not my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? If you look up in the Greek, the word forsaken, you'll find the same thing as the Aramaic said. You'll find the word spared and destiny and death. That's what tipped me off. I thought, well, there must be something wrong with the word forsaken. To leave alone, to abandon. Well, that's in there, but it depends on the context of how it's used. Christ was never abandoned. He already told the disciples, the Father will never leave me. Well, he must have lied about that if the Father left him. All right, 28. Concerning the resurrection in Acts 2, 24 and 32, and Romans 10, 9, and Romans 6, 4, and Colossians 2, 12, Jesus was raised by the Father. Romans 8, 11, and 1 Peter 3, 18, Jesus was raised by the Holy Spirit. John 2, 19, and John 10, 18, Jesus raised himself. The Father, by the Holy Spirit, raised the Son who had life in himself. You cannot break up the work of the Godhead. 29, 1 Timothy 3, 16, justified in the Spirit simply means that Christ was shown to be righteous in the Spirit. Other scriptures that tells of people that, were, that they justified God. Did God need to be justified? No, they merely showed him by their declarations to be a righteous God. They didn't justify him. They spoke that he was justified. Number 30 from Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, Christ was tempted in every point as we are, yet without sin. 31, Hebrews 9, 28, and Hebrews 7, 28, to bear is a substitutional sin offering, bear our sins. Christ was not separated from God, but bear the sins of the world by his physical death. The second time without sin simply means apart from, when he comes again, he's not coming again unto sin. He's coming apart from sin, without sin offering. He is not coming the second time to deal with sin. His coming will be apart from the sin substitutional work. He comes as a judge. Hebrews 7.28 verse tells us that he didn't need to offer up a sacrifice for himself because he was sinless. But the Old Testament priest did. But he offered up himself for the sins of the people. If he was going to die separate from God, then he would have had to make a sacrifice for himself also, just as the Old Testament priest type did. 32, Isaiah 53, 4 through 12, here the word born means to carry away, not become a sinner. Notice in verse 5 and 6, we are the ones who sinned. The laid on him is the same as carry, not become. This is substitutional, not identification. Verse 9, the grave physical with the wicked. Verse 10, offered for sins. Verse 11, my righteous servant. Verse 12, numbered with the transgressors, but was not a transgressor. 33, and 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, and Hebrews 9, 14, both show 
that as the fulfillment of the Old Testament lamb type, Christ was indeed a sin bearer, but not a sinner. He was not a sinner by choice or by substitution. To be a sin bearer, you cannot be a sinner. You must be offered as sinless and stay sinless through the entire process of sin bearing. And I refer you back to point 23 on that. Number 34 from Proverbs 17:15. These men say that when Jesus was hanging on the cross that he suddenly was made a sinner and became wicked. This verse tells us that anyone that committeth the just is an abomination to the Lord, condemneth, excuse me, anyone that condemneth the just or condemns a person who is righteous, that person and that act is an abomination. According to James 17, sin is something you make a choice of. It is something a person does by choice. Jesus could not just hang there on the cross and become sin or even separated from God. 35, Romans 5.8 tells us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Mankind was a sinner. Christ wasn't. He could not have been or died for us if he was a sinner. Point number 23, again, as your proof. 36, Leviticus 16, 20 through 22. Notice in verse 22 that the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities. To bear or carry, not become actual sin of or for the people. It was just an animal and should not become either a sinner by choice or by imputation by God putting it on him. Yet it covered the sins of the people so God could work with them. 37, Romans 4, 6 through 9, Abraham wasn't righteous in himself, but it was imputed. Now the word impute means to accredit. To accredit somebody as being that way. To reckon is another Hebrew word. To reckon or accredit. Abraham wasn't righteous in himself, but it was accredited or reckoned to him so in the Levitical sin offering, the guilt and punishment of the sinner fell upon the innocent animal victim. See uh, Leviticus 1.4, 4.26, 5.1, 16 and 18, plus uh, Leviticus 17.11. The truth is established that the legal guilt is transferred from the sinners upon the innocent substitute in order to satisfy violated public justice, God's public justice, and to cover the guilt. As a Levitical sacrifice was called uh, sin because the offender's guilt and punishment were now imputed to it, so Christ is called sin by the apostle when he was put under the legal guilt and penalty of man's sin by imputation. God reckoned or accounted as Christ then being the once and for all substitute that all a man's kind sin could be reckoned to be placed upon him. Not him personally, but because he was a substitute. 38, Romans 4, 20 through 25. Here's the other side of the picture with righteousness being imputed to the sinner because of Christ. If Christ became sin and separated from God, and thus the sinner's sins were imputed upon Christ, actually, then how does the righteousness of Christ become imputed to the sinner if Christ is actually sin and separated from God? That's a total contradiction. 39. So it is easy from the Bible to show that imputation, which is one of their favorite words, works two ways for the sinner. The sinner's sins are imputed upon Christ, the sin bearer, then the righteousness of Christ, still righteous after having the sins imputed upon him, righteousness being imputed then upon the same believer sinner. Imputation works both ways, and it's the same both ways. All right, 40. Just as I could not get rid of my sins by my own methods, neither can I become righteous by my own works or methods. Christ becomes a substitute for my sins, and then he becomes my righteousness. But in the process, he does not become a sinner or sin or separated from God. 41. Matthew 12, 40. Here they say that Christ will be in the torment of hell three days and three nights. This can only be talking about his body. The Spirit of Christ was alive and active and was preaching to the saints in Abraham's compartment of Hades, the place of the departed dead. Read the story in Luke 16. 42, Luke 16, 23. Here again, hell is Hades, a place of departed spirits, by definition of Greek. Notice the two compartments, righteous and unrighteous. Both compartments were only temporary. Abraham's bosom was temporary until the coming of Christ's resurrection. 
and the torment side will be there until final judgment. Matthew 10, 28. Here hell is rendered in Strong's Concordance. Number 1067 is Gehenna, a place of everlasting torment as a result of final judgment. Hell is used in other places. Uh, other places is Strong's number 86, a place of departed souls after death. Used for either righteous or unrighteous in the Gospels, and only the ungodly in the rest of the New Testament as the godly go to be with the Lord, according to Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 9. The righteous compartment is closed in hell, and uh, all of those Old Testament saints have gone to heaven. We find out in, in John chapter 14, 1 through 3, that when we die, Christ comes to meet us, and we go back to heaven at where he is, there we'd be also. So there is no more place under the earth for the righteous when they die. Only now the ungodly go down there. 44, Luke 23, 43, Jesus said today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. The thief is going to be with Jesus in this paradise, not Jesus dropping the thief off and then going down into a hell of torment. This makes the words of Jesus, It is finished, a lie, as he would have to go into the torment hell battle for three days and three nights. This takes the emphasis away from and off the blood. It is a perversion of the blood atonement. It isn't just the blood. He's now got to go fight for three days and three nights. That, that's an insult to the blood. Page 13, point number 45. The devil isn't in hell. Read all of these places that we have here. Ephesians 2.2, 2, Luke chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Job 2.2, 2, and Job 1.7. Revelation 20, verse 10, and 1 Peter 5.8. He, Satan, is not taking anyone to hell because he's not there himself, and he will not be there until the final judgment. 46, our redemption was purchased on Calvary, not hell. If it was just some mystical spiritual thing in hell, then why did Jesus have to become a man with a physical body and real blood? Why didn't God just go down there and redeem us? Why send his son? 47, taken from Matthew 26, 26 through 28, it is the broken body and the shed blood that has redeemed us. Never take away from the blood, for it is the blood that cleanses from all sin. 48 from Isaiah 53, 9. Here they say that the word death is plural or deaths. My King James has a marginal note from this word that says deaths. My running this word three deep in Hebrew does not show plural. These men use this word and plural meaning to show that Christ not only died a physical death, but a spiritual death as well, thus the plural meaning of the word. That's what they say. But I'm unable at this point to support the meaning of that word in their context. Nevertheless, even if the word were in the plural, it still could not contradict the rest of the Bible scriptures that clearly shows the impossibility of Christ dying spiritually. That's a lot. Uh, you'll want to go back and look up those scriptures because you've got an argument here about everybody that teaches and most of the church teaches that Jesus died and went down into hell and was tormented by Satan. And when that comes out of their mouth, dear friends, they are negating the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't think they know that.